I love the unity of the body of Christ and His church. Um, not only here in Nortonville to Olive Branch from the south side of Hopkins County to the north side of Hopkins County. Just a moment ago, I kind of hit my phone, you know, to, to, to fix that addiction. Did anybody message me, you know? You know what I'm talking about? Hitting that button. And I got a message from a pastor friend in, in Memphis saying he was praying over a prayer request I gave him a couple of weeks ago. And then uh, um, people requested me from, as a friend. People, I can't even read their language over in Thailand, but they, wanted, but they want to interact with other parts of the body all across the world. Friends in Haiti when I was down there in, in January, uh, talking with them and, and uh, just kind of communicating back and forth with them. The body of Christ, how amazing that is. Uh, and so I'm glad that we're able to be here with you guys uh, this evening. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22, story you're very familiar with. This is the story uh, of Abraham as he is called to sacrifice his son Isaac on the altar there after God had fulfilled the promise to give him that promised heir. And so while you're turning there, I want you to kind of think of a normal Sunday. It's Sunday morning. You've had a rough week. I mean, there's been all kinds of things that's happened throughout the week, okay? I mean, it just seems like everything that could go wrong at work, went wrong at work. I mean, maybe you're a school teacher and the kids were awful, or maybe you're working in the hospital and every patient seemed just to have be uh, a demon-possessed patient, okay? And it was just the worst week ever. Maybe, maybe it's even so much that you lost your job, or maybe you had a car wreck and now you have an un, uh, unexpected expense and you're already tight on your finances. Maybe it's a um, cancer or a loss of a loved one, or I mean, the list goes on and on, and you just had it with the week. You've gotten up every single day early to get to work. Uh, you moms, you get up, you get the kids ready to get to school and you get them fed, you get them clothed, you get them, uh, you make sure that everything is ready to go and you get them in the car and you get them to school. You get to, now you're also a working mom, so you're getting them, you're going to job, to your job as well. I mean, go, 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 go. Saturday's here. You should have a breather, right? Ah, uh, you can't have a breather. You got birthday parties and soccer games and, I mean, you just got things that you have to do. So off goes the alarm and you get up and you go do those things and a uh, fun-filled day. You, had a, you know, you're excited. You mean, you, things are going okay, but you're just tired. Well, then here comes Sunday morning, right? You can sleep in a little bit, but that alarm goes off and for some strange reason, it's a lot harder to get out of bed on Sunday. Yeah. Devil is in full force, right? That's right. I mean, there are those, I mean, now Lori would be like, you didn't, even, you didn't even move when your alarm, you didn't even set an alarm. Honey, you are my alarm, right? Lori gets up and gets the kids ready and I, I stay in bed as long as possible, okay? Every single day of the week. That's why God gave her to me. She's awesome. But isn't that the case, though? Monday, Sunday morning, a little bit longer we want to stay in bed. Satan's in full force. And everything, you didn't sleep well because all the things going through your mind, of all the things that you have, uh, you have to do or, or the things that you haven't experienced. And so, I mean, when it, you get in the car and you, you've gotten the kids ready and you're, and you're fighting and you get in the car and, and you're telling them, be quiet, be kind to your brother, don't you dare run in church, you know, all this stuff. Then you get out of the car, hey, how you doing? <laughs> right? You sit in the pew next to someone else. They never know that you've had the worst week of your life. Right. And guess what? Now the music minister gets up here. Jonathan gets up here. Mike gets up here. And they're trying to get you to engage and to sing. And for some reason, you might be saying the words, but it is so hard, it seems, that it's almost impossible to actually worship. You're so distracted. Uh, you're so filled with uh, doubt and you're filled with all the things that questions of why God did you let this happen? There's no way that you're ready to worship. 
Well, I was talking to a one song leader, and they were telling me that the way they prepare their, their service is the first song is a very upbeat, uh, powerful, energetic song to grab their attention. And then the next one is a little bit lower, a little bit lower key, but still really upbeat to try to engage them. Then the next song, he says, he brings it down and makes it a very worshipful song. By that time, they're, they're finally starting to get ready to, to engage and to actually pay attention and worship. You've just now actually gathered their attention. Then he says, you pick it up just a little bit, a little notch, and, uh, but you still keep it really low key and to enter them into a time where they're ready to receive the Word of God. And maybe, just maybe, their hearts and their minds will be ready to receive what the pastor brings from the Word, from the bread of life. And so I think that's a challenge that we all face every single week. Some maybe more than others. So let's look at the passage here in Genesis 22, verse 1. As we read this, I'm going to read the whole thing, and then we're going to focus on about, two or th- um, about four or five uh, verses. It says, Now it came about, after these things, that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. And he said, Take now your son, your only son. Um, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Morah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. And Abraham saw, said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go yonder and will worship and we will return to you. And Abraham took the wood and the burnt offering and laid it on on Isaac his son and took in his hand the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. And Isaac spoke to Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. He said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. Then they came to the place of God which he had told them. And Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have... Not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram, offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. And Abraham called the name of this place uh, Jehovah Jireh, or the Lord will provide. As it is said in this day, in the mount of the Lord it will be provided. And then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, Beside myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Indeed, I will greatly bless you and will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your seed shall possess the gate of your enemies. And in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Father, we thank you so much for um, the power of your word. And just the, your word alone will never return to you void. And it has already spoken to the hearts of some of those here. So Father, I pray that our hearts and minds will be open to receive as we dive a little bit further in into what this passage is trying to help us glean. And so Father, I pray that we will take this and apply it to our lives. And now I pray. Amen. So it's Sunday morning, you've done all that stuff throughout the week, and, and now you're trying to get ready for worship, and, but yet your heart is not ready. You have too many questions. And I look at Abraham's life here and I think of, man, if we have problems in our life, what do you think he is dealing with here in this passage? In verse 2, he says, Take your son, your only son, whom you love, and go to the land, Mora, and offer him up as a burnt offering. Take your son, your only son, the one that I promised you, the 
heir that's going to produce this great nation that I've told you you're going to have. He already said, I'm not going to do it through Ishmael. It's got to be through Isaac. And now he's saying, give up the one thing that you love more than anything else in the world. Give him up. I can see Abraham right now thinking, really, God? Really? You want me to give up the one thing that I love, the one thing that I can claim as my own, the one thing that I have some kind of power and authority over, the one thing that brings joy to my life, that seems to be sustaining me through this really hard and difficult time. You want me to give up that? But you know what? Abraham didn't do that. I think he had every right to do that. And I think every single one of us would do that. That's how Abraham was. He had a faith that he trusted God. He didn't ask those questions. It reminds me of Mark chapter 9 in there in verse 17 to 24. But what he's telling there is is there's this uh, young boy and he has his illness where he goes into seizures and convulsions and uh, he's demon possessed. And basically it even makes him to where he wants to cast himself into the water or to the flames to harm himself. And the dad has done everything that he possibly can to to, to heal his son. And he's, I mean, he has all this faith that God can do it, but he's, it's almost like he's given up. He's given up and and Jesus shows up in the picture and he says, Lord, if there's anything that you can do, at least have pity on me and my son. And God says, do you believe? Do you have faith? And he says, Lord, I believe. But then he says this, but help me with my unbelief. You know, we go throughout the week and we're, we're faced with all these challenges. And then on Sunday morning, we try to get up and we try to worship. And, but we have all these doubts and questions and, and we have so much unbelief as God's people. And we, I bet you we feel a lot like that man who's given up all hope that his son would ever be healed. And we're a lot like Abraham who's sitting there thinking that God's asking the, the, almost the most impossible thing from him. And we stand before God on Sunday and everybody else seems, we look around and everybody else seems to be singing and worshiping, which is not true, right? right. But we, we perceive that and we think, man, I'm the only one going through this. God, why are you asking me of this? Why am I going through this? And we need to just drop everything and say, Lord, help me. I believe, Lord, but help me with my unbelief. You ever been to a point in your life where you've said that prayer? Yeah. Lord, help me in my unbelief. But I want to believe. I, I want to trust you. I know you've been there for me in the past. I know that you have uh, been kind to my family. And I, I've even seen that with you taking the cancer away from my mom and, uh, and you protected me in that wreck. But at this point in my life, it just doesn't seem like you're here. Really, God? I want to believe. I just can't. I'm struggling. Help me overcome my unbelief. Help me overcome my doubts. Abraham didn't respond that way. But I don't believe it's abnormal that when we do respond that way. We move on to verse 3 and it tells us this. Abraham rose early in the morning. Rose early in the morning. He had just gotten the command from God to sacrifice his one and only son, the promised heir that was going to bring forth all the blessings that God had been promising him that he had to wait 25 years or so to get. And now he's telling him to sacrifice it. If there's any day, any day of the year that I'm going to sleep in and not do what God tells me to do and put it off as long as I can, it'd be this day. Yeah. That's right. Give up Caleb and give up Hannah, the two, your two children whom you love, and sacrifice them and give them to me. Yeah, Lord. I think I'm going to do that after lunch. Right? Yeah. But he didn't do that. He got up, rose, with it seemed without hesitation. That's not us. And once again, I don't believe that we should feel guilty when we hesitate because I believe that is something that is very common in God's Word. Look at Gideon. He, approached, he was approached by, uh, the, by the Lord and he said, Come, you mighty warrior, and come deliver me from my enemy. I'm going to take you, this, the least of the least, uh, the man of the tribe of Benjamin, the guy who's hiding out in the threshing floor whenever he should be out in, the, uh, out in the open on the hillside threshing his wheat. He's inside the wine press doing all that work instead. He's hiding away from the enemy. And God says, you mighty warrior. He's like, you're crazy. I'm not a mighty warrior. 
questioned God. He put it off. He hesitated. Not only that, but he even requested a sign from God. God, you're telling me to go against this great and massive army. But you got to prove yourself that that's what you're telling me to do. So he says, I'm going to take this fleece. Take this wool of the sheep and I'm going to lay it down. And then when the, when the dew falls, I want the fleece to be wet and I want the ground to be dry. And if that happens, then I believe the signs from you. Next morning he gets up. That's exactly what happens. He walks out. Okay, it's wet, dry. It's a good one, Lord. But you can't fool me that easy. So he says, I'm going to put it out again. And tomorrow morning, this is going to be dry and the ground's going to be wet. So he does it again the next morning, and that's exactly what happens. The fleece is dry, the ground is wet, and finally he says, all right, Lord, I'll do what you asked. Man, he's just so hesitant about doing what God's called. He's just like, Lord, I, you just can't, you, what you see in me can't be real. I'm not the mighty warrior you think that I am. I think of Habakkuk. We just finished a series at our church on Sunday nights going through the book of Habakkuk. And there's, man, he looked around and all he saw, all that he saw was violence and evil. And it says that he called out to the Lord. And when that didn't work, he cried out to the Lord in despair. And when that didn't work, he, he continued to question God. And then God said, well, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to rise up the Babylonians and the Babylonians are going to march in and they're going to uh, put you in captivity. They're going to they're oppress you and put you into slavery and destroy the Israelites. And back it's like, whoa, whoa, God. That's not what I meant. They're more evil than us. Why would you do that? See, they questioned God. They were hesitant about, be, about moving forward. We look at Moses, and it's the same way with Moses. God called him to go back. And what did he say? I can't speak. I'm not, I, I'm, I'm not articulate. I got, I, 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 I got a speech impediment. Right? They were hesitant to question God. But Abraham, take your one and only son. He's talking to you right now. Take the thing you love the most, the thing that is holding you back from complete surrender to me, and lay it at the altar. And we clench on in the pew and we hesitate. We can't truly worship until we lay it down before God. When there's something in our hearts that's keeping us from worshiping, when we have a grudge against our brother, what does it say? Leave your offering at the, at the altar, get up and you go and you make it right with that brother or sister in Christ, then you can come back and you can properly worship. Man, I can think of what's going through Abraham's mind right now. He packed up all his stuff. It, it, says he got, it says in verse 3 that he split the wood and he got his men together and he got the donkey saddled and loaded. And the whole time he, is, he got up early and he's making the preparations to go into worship. And we're just lucky to get to church on time. We're lucky just to make it. And we're rushing through the doors and everybody goes their opposite directions. And then we all gather together in the, in the sanctuary. But are we truly ready to worship? Have we made the preparations? Have we dealt with what the Lord's asked us? Have we saddled our donkeys and have we chopped the wood and have we gathered together and really prepared our hearts for the journey that's getting ready to take place? I don't believe we have many times. I'll even say as a pastor, there are times when I'm ready to go to church. There's a, a sermon he's laid in my heart, and I'm fired up, and I'm ready to go. Man, I'm going to give it to him this Sunday. Isn't that right? And there's other Sundays I get up and I'm like, man, I got to go to church. And that's just not with you guys. That's just in ministry in general. There's times where like, yeah, yeah. That's right. Brother Gary's been there. Jonathan over at Johnson Island, he was pastoring there. Probably even at youth ministry at our times. If you're in ministry, there's times when you, you, you're it's just like this. Because we're human and, and we're like everyone else. We're on that journey to make, get our hearts ready to receive worship. Yeah, we hesitate. Yeah, we have questions and doubts. Let's have a faith like Abraham. Let's go on to verse 4. On the third day... Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. The third day. What's going through your mind? Three days that you have to sit there and think about. Think about what you're going to have to do as an act of worship before God. I have never... 
God is a, he has a sense, a sense of humor because here's what's happened is every place I've been to serve, I've had to drive at least 20 minutes to go to church, okay? We finally got moved into Hanson, and then God called me to Nortonville. So it's like, you're just, you're just doing this for fun, aren't you? Right? We finally got to where we were right, across, right around the corner, and now we have to drive all the way to Nortonville. And, that's just, and so I'm used to the drive, and that drive is good sometimes. It kind of you clear your mind going back and forth. But the, the title of today's me- the night's message is this, The Long Drive to Church. It is a long road from Monday to Sunday. Now, get, understand this before I get to go any further. Worship should be an everyday, daily act. And it might take you when you're doing your quiet time. If your quiet time is only five minutes, you haven't even broken through the distractions of the day to get to the actual intimacy with the Lord in five minutes. You just read a scripture and gone with your day. Okay? There is a long journey from blocking out this world for facing the honest questions of doubts and questions that you have in your mind. To look at the things that God has asked you to give up in your life. The things that you're most desired and you're most loved. To clear the path for Him to work a mighty work in your life. It's a long journey to do that. For three days, He had His mind set on, how am I going to do this? What on earth am I going to do when I get there? Am I truly going to take my son up the mountain and give him over to the Lord? Am I truly going to bound him up and place him on the wood and uh, kill him and set his body on fire and burn part and you know burn parts of him like the sacrifice entails? Am I truly going to do that? I can imagine what's going through his mind. I'm going to look. I'm going to read uh, Psalms real quick. Psalms chapter six. If you got your Bible, you just turn there. This is a psalm that uh, part of this, a part of a psalm that David. I'm going to read part of it. I'm going to read verses two through three, and verses six and seven. It says this. It says, "Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am pining away. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are in dismay, and my soul is greatly dismayed." We go on down verse 6, it says, And I am weary with my sign. Every night I make my bed swim, and I dissolve my couch with my tears. My, my eye has wasted away with grief. It has become old because of my adversity. Depart from me, all you who do iniquity, for the Lord has heard the voice of my weeping. The Lord has heard my supplication. The Lord receives my prayer. And so we see this picture. And this here's what's going on in, the, in this psalm. He is exhausted. Exhausted. David is wore out. He is depressed. He is alone. He has cried so many tears. He has cried so much. He just simply can't cry anymore. Have you been to a place in that, in, like that, in your life, where it doesn't, you've, you don't think you have any more tears? To spare. He can't understand why God, the God who created all things, the God who has the power to change the circumstances, the God who called him up as a shepherd boy to, to deliver uh, the Israelites from Goliath, to, to be the one who slain the ten thousands, who could change his circumstances with the snap of a finger, why God won't do it. More than that, you read more and more psalms and you see that there's, David has so many questions sometimes and you, and you ask, why does he have so many questions when he is a man after God's own heart? Because he, just like any one of us, no matter how much of a godly life you live, we are not spared from the troubles of this world. Actually, the more that you live for the Lord, the more you're guaranteed to face the trials and troubles of this world. And so here we are. We're exhausted. We're worn out. We're depressed. We're alone. We've cried so many tears. We have no other tears to offer. And we can't understand why the things that we go through in our life, why God will not deliver it when he absolutely is able and has the power to do so. Once again, we're not alone in this. What do you think Job felt? All his friends were saying, you must have done something wrong. His wife saying, you just curse God and die. And he's like, but I've not forsaken the Lord. Lord, why is this taking place in my life? Jeremiah, a prophet who, who through his whole ministry, never had one convert. And they call him the weeping prophet because of the, the trials that he faced. Elijah faced depression and he wanted to even die because of the, the troubles that he faced. 
We read the book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. And what did that book say? Everything is in vain. This life is in vain. Breathing and everything, work, all that stuff, it's in vain. It's meaningless. He ends that book, though, with the one thing that's not meaningless is the Lord and the preaching of the Word. They all express confusion. They all express doubt. They all express the fact that they experience unbearable pain and suffering in their life. So what, is, what, what, is, what are you suffering from? What are, what are you dealing with? What is it from keeping you from making that journey from the trials in this life to worshiping God? What's going through your mind on the three-day journey to worship? How am I going to find a new job? I lost my job. Lord, provide me a new job. I've, I've, been, I've been jobless for, for months now. How am I going to continue to pay for the bills in my family? Lord, I lost a baby. and I just can't seem to get over that loss. It's, just, it's unbearable to me to think that a, a child is so innocent that you would take their life. I've lost a loved one and maybe it's someone who they've lived their life and that's an easier burden for us to carry when they pass on. But what if it was a tragic accident or unexpected? Those seem to weigh on us the most and we, we question God and we know that we know in the back of our mind that God has an overall plan but we simply cannot see it. Why is the one person that I care about the most, why are they fighting this disease, this cancer? Why are they battling? Why can I not overcome this addiction? Same prayer you pray over and over and over again. Seems to go unanswered. Maybe it's a prayer for that husband or that wife. Lord, save them. But yet it doesn't seem to, there doesn't seem to be no feet to that prayer. And then we ask, Lord, Lord bring my children back to you. Bring them back to a place where they're in fellowship with you. I know, they, I know that their decision they made when they're younger was a genuine decision, but, and I've tried my best to be that parent or that grandparent, but for, they, need, they need a touch from the Holy Spirit to draw them back into your presence. And we pray those prayers over and over. And those prayers, unanswered prayers, are the same ones we bring to church every time the doors are open. Wednesday, Sunday, Sunday night, whatever time that might be. And we have those questions in our mind, and then we dwell on those and, those and those questions keep us from experiencing the worship that he wants do you think when we get to heaven do you think when we stand in glory do you think when we surround his throne and the elders are 24 elders are singing and the, and the saints are singing their praise and only the saints can sing and the angels are joining in and rejoicing do you think when we worry about all this petty stuff in the world no how do we get to that point where we have heaven uh, on earth now? We got to make the journey. Lord, what is it you want me to give up? What is it that's holding me back from worshiping you? You got to remember verse 2. Verse 2 tells us, give up your son, your only son. He's telling me every Sunday, uh, Lee, give up what you love the most. Give up what you love the most. You know, what I think, you know what I think that answer is for most of us? I think it's our pride. <coughs> Giving up that control to the Lord. We don't want to surrender that. I think what most of us love the most is ourselves. <laughs> We ask this question here, every, after, after everything that I'm dealing with, all things I've gone through this week, Lord, you're going to ask me to give up the one thing that's holding it all together? The answer, this is a really easy, simple answer. I love this answer. It's great. Absolutely. Absolutely he is. That's what he requires from us. Complete surrender. I surrender all. I don't I surrender some. It doesn't say in Romans chapter 12, it doesn't say become a living sacrifice. When it says become a living sacrifice, it means your whole body. You don't just chop off your arm and lay it on the altar and say, you can have that part of me, Lord. No, a living sacrifice. Everything about us, our marriage, our children, our finances, uh, how we act in the workplace, how we act on the ball field when your kid's on the team and the ref makes a bad call. And I'm at fault there. So, 
how, how much are you surrendering? All of us. Surrender all of us. Give up what you love the most. Verse 5, it says, And Abraham said to his uh, young men, Stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go yonder, and we will worship, and we will return to you. My question is, are you prepared to worship when you enter into his presence? Do you have faith like Abraham? Abraham says in, in Hebrews chapter 11, which I believe is what Justin spoke about this morning. It's what Jonathan was telling me. And in that list of all the people who have great faith that Abraham's listed in there. And it says, even if I had to sacrifice my son, he had faith that God could bring him back to life to fulfill the promise that he had made me. That's the kind of faith Abraham had. Do we have that kind of faith that even if we have to surrender, that God, would, that God would still fulfill His end of the bargain? In our Sunday school class, we're talking about Solomon right now. Solomon requested and he asked for wisdom. He could ask for anything in the world to benefit himself. And what he asked for was wisdom to serve others. And God said, because you ask for something that glorifies me and serves others and not yourself, then you're also going to get the riches and the honor and the glory. If we give up what God is asking us to surrender, when we lay down our troubles and, our, and the problems we've had all week long at His feet and make that journey to worship and put Him first, seek, his, him, his, seek him first and His righteousness, then all the other things will be added unto us. Don't, understand, don't, don't misunderstand me. I'm not doing no prosperity gospel. You do good things and all good things will happen to you. No, we're going to face trials and troubles and, and tri tribulations and suffering. But I will say that you will be blessed. If not in this life, in the next. Are you prepared for worship? Do you have a faith like Abraham? He, his faith was great. He said, we will worship and return. He had faith that God would make a way for his son to come back with him. Are you willing to give it up? Are you willing to give all of it up? Now here is the most beautiful picture in this story. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, laid it on, his, on Isaac, his son. He took his hand, um, took the hand in his hand, the fire and the knife, so the two of them walked on together. And if you fast forward about 2,000 years, you see another son who puts uh, the wood upon his back and he walks up the, the hill to be the sacrifice for us. And that person's name was Jesus Christ. And what did he do? He did not hold anything back. He gave his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross for all of us. And so he's not asking you to give up anything that he hasn't already given up himself. Amen. Amen. And if we're willing to lay it down, in verse 17 and 18, it says, I will greatly bless you and multiply you. And then it says in verse 18, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. So in the fact that we trust in the sacrifice that God made for us and that he didn't hold anything back for us, we ought to return the favor and not hold anything back from God and lay it down. Yes, when we wake up on Sunday morning, the journey to worship is a hard journey. When you wake up on Monday morning that, uh, and you enter your, into your devotion time, it's a hard journey to get rid of all the distractions of all the things you know you have to do to get to a place where you can actually enjoy the Word of God. But it's a journey that we must take, make, and it's, a, and it's a sacrifice we must make to lay it down before God and say, Lord, take it all. Take me. Take the, most th take the one thing that's standing in my way of worshiping you. And use me however you see fit. You didn't hold back your son who gave me eternal life, whose death on the cross. I'm not going to hold anything back from you. And in doing so, it says he will bless us. But not so that you can enjoy the blessing all by yourself, but so you can turn around and bless others. So when you truly open your heart up to worship and you're blessed, you're to be a conduit to, for it to flow through you to someone else. As we uh, prepare for the invitation, what is it that the Lord's asking you to lay down so you can make, begin that journey to worship? 
What do you have to begin to work on in your life? What sacrifices do you need to make? Where is He calling you to serve? Maybe you're not serving. I can tell you in our church, we need people helping in the children's and in the youth and in the choir and in the outreach ministry and as greeters. We need those people to step up and to fill those positions and I know that they need them here too. And if you're thinking, there's no place for me to serve, we'll make a place for you to serve. God wants the whole body to serve. But what is it that you need to sacrifice? What is it you need to lay down to begin your journey to worship? As we sing, please stand as we sing number 275. I surrender all. What are you going to surrender this evening? Thank you. 